Here is a man who combines his love of history and music. He's a publisher. He's an artist. Please give it up for Mike Stacks. What is it that motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? Maybe it's uh, a desperate urge to pee, right? Maybe it's the smell of egg and bacon coming from the uh, kitchen, but um, you're going to need more than eggs and bacon. Um, you need something more. You need something that inspires you enough that when you open your eyes in the morning and when you wake up, you can't wait to get started on your day. You've got to find something that you're passionate about, something that you believe in, and then work at it and work at it and work at it until you get good at it, and then work at it some more until you get better. When I wake up in the morning, I can hardly wait to get out of bed. Maybe not every morning, okay, but most mornings, because I found that motivating passion. I found what I love doing. I found my voice. My name's Mike Stacks. I'm a writer. I'm a publisher. I'm an editor, and for the past 30 years, I've been publishing my own rock and roll magazine, fanzine, called Ugly Things. That's what I do every day. That's my job. That's how I pay my bills. It doesn't, but it doesn't feel like a job because I love doing it. Not only do I love doing it, I feel compelled to do this every day, pretty much. So let me tell you my story because getting to be where I am now was not an easy road. And it took a lot of hard work and commitment and uh, probably some dumb luck, too. I grew up in England. When I was still in high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. You know, some people, like some kids in school, you know, they knew they wanted to be a doctor, they wanted to be a lawyer or a train driver or a firefighter or whatever. I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. None of those sounded good to me. My grades were pretty good. They were actually really good in stuff like English. So I thought, you know, everybody figured, you know, he'll go to college get a degree in English and become, I don't know, an English teacher. But I couldn't really see myself as an English teacher. You know, back then it was kind of like the, the tweed jacket with the leather elbow patches, maybe a beard with some granola in it. I didn't really sound like me, you know? So the other thing that I really cared about, the main thing I really cared about was music, rock and roll music. Uh, and it was kind of specific, too. It wasn't just any rock and roll music. I was into the music of the 1960s. I was into bands like the early Rolling Stones and the Who and the Velvet Underground and the Kinks, stuff like that. Um, and not, o not only did I like listening to these records and finding these records, I liked reading about it and learning about it. And I figured if I found out a lot, enough about this music, maybe one day I could write about it. But you know, how would that turn into a career? I had, again, no idea. So there I am in school. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. In the meantime, a couple of my friends and I, we started a band, and uh, we started playing some rock and roll music. I didn't really have any natural musical aptitude, but, you know, I worked at it and got to be okay, because, you know, it's only rock and roll. It's not classical music or jazz, you know? But little did I know it, but that turned out to be my ticket to somewhere. Um, and, that, and, it kind of, and that came to answer the question, what am I going to do with my life? So... Uh, I was listening to the radio late one night in my little village in Yorkshire in the north of England, and I heard this song by a band called the Crawdaddies. And uh, I thought at first that uh, it was a band from the 60s. I thought it was an old record. But, um, hang on, there you go. <laughs> uh, it sounded exactly like the Rolling Stones in 1964 or 65, but it turned out it was a new band from San Diego, California. And um, so I, you know, I went out and bought their records, and, and I liked them so much that uh, I decided I'd write these guys a fan letter. So uh, you know, I sent them a letter. You know, I love your music, by the way. I got my own band. We're trying to do the same kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing. A few weeks later, I got a letter back. I said, "Thanks for your letter. Uh, by the way, we were wondering. Our bass player just left. You want to move out to San Diego, California, and play in our band?" <laughs> Well, that was an unexpected development, to say the least. Uh, it took me about a tenth of a second to make my decision. So uh, I had to save up some money. I went and worked in a vacuum cleaner factory for a while. <laughs> it took me a few months, but at the end of 1980, I 
moved out to San Diego from Yorkshire, England. I had a bass guitar in one hand, suitcase in the other, and I had, I think, maybe 200 bucks in my pocket. So that began what I like to call the starvation years. <laughs> uh, playing in a band is not very lucrative, especially if you're playing music that's 15 years out of date, like I was. So uh, <laughs> we struggled. And there was another thing, you know, I wasn't in it for the money, I, you know, but I wanted basic food and shelter, and sometimes there wasn't even enough for that. Um, and there was another thing, too. Um, I was an undocumented worker. I was an illegal alien. I wasn't even supposed to be working. I wasn't supposed to be here. I came over as a tourist. I was supposed to leave in six weeks. So uh, that was over 30 years ago. But uh, getting back to finding my voice, you know, I got through the starvation years. Uh, and um, in about 1983, I decided I want to start my own fanzine. A fanzine is like a magazine published by fans for fans. And uh, I decided I was going to call it Ugly Things, which is after my favorite band from the 60s called The Pretty Things. So uh, Ugly Things was going to be a platform for my opinions, uh, and I wanted to turn people onto this music that I was excited about. Um, not the well-known bands from the 60s, there's all kinds of books about them out there, but the unknown bands who maybe just released a few records, maybe just one, and then disappeared. There were thousands of them in the 60s, actually tens of thousands of bands, and uh, all over the world. I wanted to tell their stories, I wanted to give them a voice. So, starting in 1983, that's what I began to do. So this is the early 80s, remember. Um, the first 10 issues were done not even on a computer. There were no computers. We lived in caves. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> it was all typed up on an electric typewriter. We cut it out and shrank it down on a Xerox machine and glued it to sheets, and, and uh, that's how it was done. Uh, you know, there was no scanners, so we had to shoot the photos as halftones. And uh, the titles I used to use was rub on letters, you know, or I'd do them by hand. You know, that was the way it was done. It was, it was primitive. Um, the first issue was about 30 pages. We printed 200 copies, and they all sold out, so we printed another 200. And from there, it started to grow. It was 30 pages, 60 pages, 120 pages. And then, you know, it was 200 copies, 400 copies, 800 copies, 2,000 copies. Today, most of our issues are over 200 pages, or, you know, not to over 200 pages, but around 200 pages, and we sell about 5,000 copies all over the world. Now, I didn't always make a living off this. It was about seven or eight years ago that I was finally able to quit my day job, and you know, I reached a point where I was able to do this full time. I'd worked at a newspaper for about 12 years, and there I learned not only about writing, but also gathering content from other writers, selling advertising, distribution, promotion, uh, dealing with printers, dealing with distributors, dealing with advertisers, the day-to-day -day stuff of running a business. That was an education in itself. So that's where it got me to where I am now. I'm not a millionaire, but the magazine's doing well. And unlike a lot of people, I can't wait to get out of bed in the morning and start working on it. Now, one of the best things about running a magazine like Ugly Things is that uh, I never run out of bands to write about. Like I said earlier, there are tens of thousands of bands that formed in the wake of the Beatles. And we also cover bands from the 70s, too. So, you know, add another 10,000 bands that we can write about. All of them have stories. All of the stories are different, and some of them are very unique. Um, there was a TV crime show in the late 50s called The Naked City. And uh, it used to end with a narrator saying, there are eight million stories in the, in the Naked City. This was just one of them. It's kind of like that. So I want to tell you about a few of the most unique and interesting stories that I've covered in the magazine. There's a band called The Monks. This band was really ahead of their time. Five American guys who were in the military in the uh, early and mid-60s, based in Germany, and they met on an army base, and they formed a band. They decided they were going to call themselves The Monks, and they had a whole concept around the idea of them being monks. They shaved the tops of their heads, to tonsures like monks. They wore only black clothing and a rope around the neck like a noose. So they looked weird, <laughs> scary even, you know? And the music too was really strange. They had the drummer doing these weird jungle drum patterns 
One guy had a banjo with an electric pickup on it, and all he did was just make percussive sounds that sound like a snare drum along with the drums. There was a keyboard doing all these hysterical, panicky kind of keyboard lines, really loud, rumbling bass, and the guitar and the bass were using feedback to make all these noises. This was 1966, and they had these strange lyrics, real simplistic and harsh, like, I hate you, but call me. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, don't cry. And uh, why do you kill all those kids over there in Vietnam? They made this one insane album called Black Monk Time, and then they disappeared. Just a few record collectors knew about them. So me and one of my friends, we tracked down a couple of the guys, and we told their story and ugly things. And um, that ended up leading to these guys reconnecting. They all lived in different parts of the country, having been in the military. And they got back together, they did these sold out reunion shows in New York and in across Europe. And there's a now acclaimed documentary film about them that a German uh, company made, which is really excellent. So it all, that all started because we tracked down these guys to get their story. Another one. There's the issue. Maybe you don't know this, but back in the 60s, right here in the Inland Empire, there was a really great music scene. Um, it's with great bands uh, who made records, and I'm going to tell you about the best one, which is Misunderstood. Uh, they're pictured there right next to the uh, Mission Inn. The alleyway is still there. Um, this is another band with a unique sound. They were inspired by the English bands, like the Yardbirds and the Animals, but they sounded completely different. For one thing, they had a guy who played the steel guitar. Now, steel guitar, you associate that with country, country music, right? Cowboy music or whatever. This is nothing like, nothing like country music. This guy, his name was Glenn Campbell, not the same guy that was the rhinestone cowboy. This guy, Glenn Campbell, he got these crazy sounds out of his steel, like uh, with a fuzz tone and with feedback, and it sounded like race cars or rocket ships or screaming banshees or something. So, in fact, the music was a little too ahead of its time for Riverside in 1966, probably maybe even today, I don't know. So uh, a DJ friend of theirs, ra radio DJ friend of theirs, called John Peel, who later became very f uh, famous, he's an English guy, he told him, uh, why don't you go to England, and the, the music scene there is a little further ahead, so uh, maybe you'll do that. So a bit like I did, 15 years later, only in reverse, they went from Riverside and moved to London, and they you know, did the whole starvation part too, you know? But uh, they ended up with uh, a record contract, and their record company was convinced that they were going to be the next big thing, that this was the sound of the future. So the first record was ready to be released, and what happens? The lead singer gets his draft notice. Now, back then, you know, this is 1966. Uh, you c if you were 18 years old and you weren't in college and you weren't, didn't have some kind of illness, you, you were going to go in the military, and you, you were going to go to Vietnam, and you might die as well. So his record company said, look, go back to America. We'll give you, you know, our lawyers will make up some paperwork. You're under contract to us, and uh, you'll get a deferment. So this guy, Rick Brown, he went back, went to the draft board. They took one look at his papers, threw it right in the trash can in front of his eyes, shipped him off the boot camp. End of the misunderstood. But uh, what he, he, didn't, he wasn't going for the boot camp thing. He ran away. He got a fake passport. He fled to India. He became a Hindu monk. <laughs> he lived, shaved his head. He lived in an ashram, no electricity or, or running water or anything. He was on the run for years. He ended up having all kinds of adventures in India and Nepal. He found a ruby mine, ended up uh, uh, trading and you know, selling uh, gemstones. So it's an amazing story, and, and we ran it in Ugly Things, and, uh, and uh, later we turned it into a screenplay and a book. And, uh, so maybe one day you're going to see it at a multiplex, probably butchered beyond all recognition. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, you can probably tell why I'm excited to get up in the morning and work on stories like this. I get to not only be a writer, but also kind of a detective finding people, meeting them, getting their stories. There's a story that will appear in the next issue, which is out next week. Uh, it took me almost 13 years to unravel this story as a real mystery case involving this guy, a guy named Craig Smith. He was this real charismatic, super talented kid from Studio City up in LA. In the 60s, he was really on the fast track to fame. 
He got a job first as a singer on the Andy Williams show, which was like one of the highest rated variety shows. He was on there singing and dancing and doing all that stuff. But then he formed his own rock band. They were produced by Mike Nesmith of the Monkees, which was one of the biggest bands at the time. But also that, he was making all kinds of money writing songs for people like the Monkees and Andy Williams and Glenn Campbell. This time, I do mean the rhinestone cowboy guy. So, uh, but then his story gets weird. He decided we'd take all his money and he'd go travel around the world. So he went to uh, Turkey, he went to Afghanistan, he went to India, and something happened to him along the trail there when he was traveling, because he came back and he was completely different. He wasn't the outgoing, happy, charismatic guy anymore. He was dark and strange. He said he wasn't called Craig Smith anymore. He said his name was Maitreya. He, saw, he thought he was the next Messiah, and in the year 2000, he would be crowned king of the world. So he released a couple of albums of his music, which are just fantastic music, but the covers are all covered in this strange writing, all about him being the Messiah. It's really strange, disturbing stuff. These records now sell for, ten, for thousands of dollars. They're very rare. But he disappeared completely. No one knew where Craig Smith was. They figured he was either dead or in some kind of mental institution. So finding a guy called Smith, that's just about the hardest thing, because there's like a million Smiths out there. But eventually, I did find out that he was living on the streets in Los Angeles. And he's homeless for 30 or 40 years, living on the streets. And uh, if you want to find out what happened to him, you're going to have to uh, check out the new issue of the magazine. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, there he is after he came back. So this is what I do. I still make music myself. I have a band called The Loons. But I also write, and I publish this magazine, and I tell people stories. I not, only, I not only found my voice, I like to think I gave voice to some other people that maybe didn't, wouldn't have had a voice to talk about their music and what they had accomplished. Um, and, it's, and I should add, it's not just me writing the magazine. I have all kinds of other writers that are also telling the stories of these people. Um, but uh, I work very hard, probably too hard. But um, it's, I feel like this is what I was born to do. This is my purpose in life. This is my voice. So my point to you today is if you can find your voice, if you can find your purpose, if you can find what you want to do and work at it and just don't give up, starve if you have to for a while, then you've got it made, because not only will your life be worth living, but every day will be filled with possibilities. Thank you.